Hello everyone, welcome to The Secret Path. This is my dad, Roger Dean's podcast, but I like to join in on the intros because dad will tell you about the people he talks to and their professional background and his history with them. And I will tell you little interesting anecdotes about when I met them incidentally sometimes. And I think that gives it a nice rounded flavor. Not for any reason, she'll keep me on the straight and narrow. Yeah, Can I'll tell you the me. truth guys. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I've only invited people I like. <laughs> so today we're talking to Ian McKay, who is a fantastic figurative artist. He's really great at drawing people and costumes and all kinds of stuff. And I was introduced to him by Michael Kaluta when we were both working on the Onyx project in San Francisco. And Michael took me out to meet Ian at his studio, which he was renting, which was a fabulous place in the Redwoods. And then we went to Skywalker Ranch, where Ian is working on a Star Wars film. He's worked on a whole bunch of Star Wars films and all kinds of other films. He's, he is also a filmmaker and a writer. And he has some very neat recipes for curing various elements. So he's an amazing person. Hence why and I know and like him. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, we, uh, was it the first time we met? We were all going to go for dinner with Dave McKean and yeah. we'd driven about an hour already. And then I was feeling pretty unwell. And we had to stop in a bar and he had this idea for what would make me feel better, but they did not have the appropriate ingredients and I just couldn't go on. So you guys went off for dinner and my mum had to come and pick me up and we went to the supermarket to get all the various things he suggested. And within an hour, within an hour, I was feeling better, which was frustrating because if that pub had had it, I could have carried on and had dinner with you guys. But it was quite amazing. Perhaps we'll put it in the show notes. <laughs> as they say <laughs> but I don't want to give away what was ailing me <laughs> so this is Ian I hope you enjoy it. actually I, I want to say yeah it was an amazing talk um for me to listening uh there were a couple of things I wanted to say though you and Ian talk about a book which Ursula Le Guin wrote about writing which is called The Wave in the Mind I just wanted to put the title in in case anyone was wondering what the book was you yes. she, she also mentioned something like you guys talked about um how you get lots of ideas and you know your your idea for something doesn't come straight from one reference you collect references over time and then they percolate and in her book she references the poet gary snyder who who had a really good analogy for it do you remember no tell me he said it was like composting and you take all of these different elements and you put them on the compost heap and he said, you want lots of variety. You don't just want all mushrooms or all tomatoes or all whatever. You want a good variety of things. And I thought it was a particularly good analogy because of something else that you said, which is when the brain is daydreaming and at rest, it creates the most heat and energy because it's working harder. Or well, that's how you at least measure the work of the brain. And composts yeah. are like that. When they're, when they're composting and squashing everything in and making some lovely fertile soil, they heat up and that's why all the little animals like them. Just like a brain. The more things you put on it, the hotter it gets and then the better produce. That's true. When gardeners in Victorian times and earlier laid out exotic gardens for plants that needed heat, they used compost. And the compost generated heat over the whole of the winter. Ah. Anyway, know, everyone. <laughs> too much for distractions. Here is Ian. He's a brilliant guy. <laughs> Have fun, everyone. Record everything now. All right, then. I agree. So we're on, I think. Yes. All right. Thanks, we're Roger. Recording. Good to see you again. <laughs> This is brilliant. Let's do it every week. <laughs> okay, I'm up for that. It's a great way to start. Well, and also, here's the thing. I, I've i never liked giving interviews to talk about what I've done in the past. I love giving interviews, but what I did last night. Right. Right. Because it's fresh and it's exciting. And I think if you lead a good creator's life, 
you try to be reckless and brave and jump joyfully and boldly into the unknown. And you come up with something and it's like fire from the gods and I just want to tell somebody. <laughs> <laughs> so Roger. So who's sitting I, in the background with the tranquilizers? <laughs> <laughs> they don't work. <laughs> So I have, I have some epiphanies from last night. I don't know if you can see, there's tons of papers littering the top there. Right, so right. what are they? Tell me if, the if you, were, if you were to pan. Well, I'm doing, I'm doing my sketchbook. Right. Before, it's the 40 years of sketches. Whoa. But something we talked about last time stuck in my head as, as the little grain that you build a pearl around. And it was the difference between what you and I find passionate in in subject matter because you said you love landscapes yes and Thanks. i love people yes and i thought well wait a minute how what did roger get that half and then they did only have this left and that's what they gave to me or <laughs> like <laughs> we're both artists we we both get ideas we even paint roughly in the same genre so how did we get divided like that so what I wanted to ask you first, yeah. what is it about landscapes that gets your passion? Well, I'm gonna diverge from that question, but I won't not answer it. I'm gonna come okay. straight back and answer it. But I remember once I had an exhibition in London and there was a guy there and he said, oh, I could sell your work in the Middle East. And I was <laughs> thinking, yeah, you know, and he said, <laughs> It's fantastic. There are no figures in it. <laughs> and I said, but there are. You, you just haven't seen them. He said, well, wait a minute. What do you mean? I said, well, any picture, any one of these pictures has got figures. Look, there's half a dozen standing on that rock. There's a whole bunch over here. Look, there's about 15 in this painting. And he right. said, I can't sell it. <laughs> Can you take them out? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I know your figures. Your, your work was, I first saw your work when I was at art school. And I had, I had grown up on, you know, I was in America and Canada. Come on, grown up. you know Frank. that you were at art school before me. <laughs> <laughs> your, book, your book came out right at the end of my four years at art school. I planned it. Yeah. But before that, I'd grown up on Frank Frazetta and Norman Rockwell and, and uh, James Bama and a lot of, you know, the great fantasy and realist illustrators. People who are brilliant and, at figures, by the way. Absolutely. Yes. And that's, so that's what I drew and, you know, read a lot of comic books, but also I was a big reader from very young. So most of my inspiration and heroes are, are literary, you know, particularly Ray Bradbury. Ray was, Ray is still one of my, my greatest inspirations ever. Um, and uh, I think it's because I read his books and my head started to fill up like a balloon with ideas. Mm -hmm. I had to start drawing them down or it would explode. So um, when I moved to Britain, this was back pre-internet. I know gasp from the younger audience, but yeah, there was a pre-internet. And there was no access to Frank Rosetta. There was no access to James Bama. Norman Rockwell right. was right. still um, thought of as kitsch. Do you remember how after his, I mean, his career was amazing and he was super famous, but as soon as he passed away, he was the thing to tear down. Yes. But illustrators went in a very different direction and, and fine art went in a massively different direction, even during his life. Kind of and, a cul-de-sac, really. Right, yes, I would agree. <laughs> Good things in there, right? Worth if you're out for a long walk, it's good to go down to the cul-de-sacs too. <laughs> but I wouldn't want to live there. Oh, actually, I do live in a cul-de-sac. What am I talking about? Anyway, so in Britain, I was cut off from you know the the mainstream that was feeding my imagination, and I I'm grateful to it because I had to find things over in Britain and Europe that I would never have seen probably in America. And I found Arthur Rackham, and I found Mucha, and I found, you know, just this wealth of fantastic art 
but yeah. it's very different than the American style. And I think always like to think I'm some sort of fusion of those two, but again, figurative, yeah. right? And then out came your book. And I, books are my first love. Film is fine, but I, I love books with a passion. And where were the fantasy books in Britain? The, uh, there wasn't, I think there was one book by Big O Publishing way, way, way back, but that was it. And so I couldn't point to anything that, you know, my career is here. Look, Actually, someone's done it. <laughs> we, 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 we started publishing went uh, with my book and we then went on to do 10 or 15 books a year. And they were I, all distributed by Big O. Oh, <laughs> okay. So suddenly here I was in this strange land, unfamiliar land, loving the new things I'm finding, but pining for the stuff I had. And then this light comes on called views. And, <laughs> and I was like, oh, you're here. You're here. I'm home. <laughs> and seriously, all of, I'm not just doing this to make you feel good. All of the books. But, but it does. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay then. All of the books that you published under, you know, your, your two imprints um, were, I have them. I have them still. They're actually behind the chair over here filling that entire shelf. Right. And they, every one of them was a new um, island in the world that I used to belong to that was somehow merged with the one I now belong to. And by then I'd learned you don't copy your heroes. You, you acknowledge them and you thank them and you look at them for joy yeah. and then you put them away and you go back to the, the real world and what's in here and you try to find that, put it down and make them proud, right? L live up to that grand tradition. Um, and you can only do that by being yourself, by being original. For, for, for many reasons, not least of which, it's the only way to truly enjoy what you're doing. Yeah. And yeah. the only way to be good is to truly enjoy it, I think. And, and that's, that's my answer to the question, where do you get your ideas from? Joy. Yes. Yeah. I, yes. Yeah. I, I, think, I think actually any strong emotion would do. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like feeling angry. So I try to go for joy. But um, I've noticed that, you know, when I'm very, very emotional in any state, I can sit down and rip through a sketchbook in a few hours, you know, uh, hundreds of drawings. Yeah. And I, th I think you springboard off of passion and joy and emotion into a realm of inspiration. And, and you don't think of it as inspiration. You think of it as necessity mm. to record and to, to pull some of that with you. And then when you wake up out of that dream state, lo and behold, you're left with some things. And sometimes I wonder where they came from. You know, it's that magical. Oh, absolutely. and then you have to work. Yeah. Then you have to refine the ore, <laughs> shape the fire, make it make sense so you can show it and share it with other people. Yes, absolutely. I, I, I totally get that because my sketchbooks are full of wrong directions. Yes. If you look at a couple of years later, they are the perfect themselves rather than the imperfect what I was looking for. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And and I think everybody does that. Um, again, it's that schism of, and I still want to have that question answered. Why did you go that way? And I went this way. Because what? you're, <laughs> but, but people do the same thing. They look at art and artists and either they're drawn towards that and they try to become an artist themselves. Yeah. Or they say, oh, I give anything if I can draw, but yeah, that's not my thing. It's like, really? <laughs> and, and yet every, every night you go to bed and you dream perfect people, perfectly drawn, wonderfully animated, pretty good dialogue and scripts in fantastic landscapes. And then you wake up and think you can't do that? Really drawing, <laughs> drawing and creating, it's, it's just dreaming when you're awake. That's all. And you're not even that awake. Half the time you're in that strange dream state and woe be told, if you wanted to talk to me and interview me while I was deep in a dream state, God knows what you'd hear. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I would tell you I have an insight into that. But oh, let's hear it. <laughs> I, 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 I used to tell Freya stories that I made up. And um, inevitably, I would fall asleep. And she'd be, you know, carry on, carry on, sort of punching me to carry on telling her stories. Right. And I'd say, I can't, I'm too sleepy. They don't make sense anymore. She said, it doesn't matter, keep going. <laughs> <laughs> They're sometimes better that way. <laughs> yes, I'd, I'd do that for my kids too. Our, our rule was there had to be, they, they would, I wanted them to be part of the storytelling. So I would ask them to give me a creature, a place and a food. And I would have to instantly make up a story that would have all three of those things in it. And if I missed one, they would get another story. Oh. And, and because they never wanted to go to sleep, I had the most racked audience <laughs> hanging on every word. <laughs> but honestly, that's kind of all you need. Sometimes I think Neil Gaiman was, was famous for saying that um, when someone asks him to write a story and they say, oh, write anything, he sits and stares at the blank page for, or the blank screen forever. Whereas when it's very specific and they try to put him in a box, we artists know what to do with boxes. <laughs> so I, I'm the same. I like something, some parameters there that I can play off of or stomp on or honor. Yeah. yeah. Better stuff comes out that way. So you asked me what I was doing last night. So it's yeah. the sketchbook, which is 40 years of sketches. But once I started putting them in the book, and I didn't just take a page and put page for page, I would grab this drawing here, this one from 20 years later, this one I just did last night, and put them on the page together. And the moment images of any kind are on a page, but especially people, they start to have a relationship. And yeah. I found that I was constructing I may not agree, but I was constructing a landscape. It was alive, right? Every page now had an emotional, an emotion to it somehow, yes. just because people were staring suspiciously at each other that had never met before, or someone's smiling and then there's monsters in the background. And that, that makes you create a story in your head. And I thought, okay, well, let's have a character run through this landscape. Let's see what happens. Would this person interact with them? Would they mind that he was there? Would they be friends? Would they try and kick him out of the sketchbook? And that's really, that's what I'm doing now. I'm almost, almost finished. And those many sketches over there are the, the climax, the finale of what happens in his journey through the sketchbook. I'm really looking forward to seeing that. I, I will send you a preview copy before anyone else has seen it. <laughs> well, I would welcome your thoughts too, because uh, I watched your um, interview on, on the publishing side of things last night. And it's true. Your, your books are beautiful to have and to hold. There's something treasure-like about them that is different from other books. Um, but still and, a long way short of what I imagined. Well, are you going to do it again ever? Apparently I am, because I have really? one person who's been twisting my arm for a year. <laughs> <laughs> um, if I can help, count me in. Oh, God, yes. <laughs> I love your books, and I love books. And I really? think we need more beautiful books out there, especially now when people are still buying books, and they because they stuck with us, they deserve some really special ones. <laughs> right. Well, we did have little teeny successes and a lot of failures. The two big successes were we insisted on all the books being sewn, even mm. paperback. So that was a success. Yeah. And we pretty much got away with insisting on color on every page throughout. Right. Even if there wasn't a color picture. Right. Because black and white is never the same. It depends what black you use and, and uh, all the variations of things in, in a single tonal drawing are incredible. Yeah. Just a flat printing will get rid of that. Yeah. And, and Alan Lee is a prime example of that. 
Yeah. So many subtle colors in his very monochromatic images. <laughs> <laughs> it would be wasted in a black and white look. Yes, indeed. And sadly, at that time, um, early 70s, if you went into an art bookshop and you bought an expensive art book, right. it might have 10 color plates. Right. And you'd think 95% um, <laughs> words. Right. Maybe black and white and maybe yeah. a yeah. dozen color plates or less or more, you know, but they were not about the art. They were about the ideas of some person several yeah. steps removed from un understanding the artist. It's true. It's true. I, I think also people, well, this actually dovetails a little bit with, um, you know, the future and, and, my optimism for where the world is going, despite all appearances to the contrary. Um, I think people misunderstand what pictures are or what illustration can be, right? It's a language. Yes. It's, it's not there as a decoration to the book. It's there to continue the storytelling of the book. And we teach it like it's some sort of magic trick right it's a thing that an elite group of people do that you have to have talent for that um, then goes in a gallery gets sold for a lot of money or that you then offer in service to a true creator like a writer or a director or something and you try to illustrate their words but it's not that it's a collaboration yeah. of storytellers and yeah. if we taught all of the all of the arts as language arts and not as a separate category called art. We could then use it for everything. People would learn art and music and dance and theater and cinema and anything that uses art to convey stories. And we could use that in science, and history, and you know, it supports every other topic you could learn. And just, just like learning French allows you to say things that you probably can't say exactly the same way in English. All of these language arts allow you to say things much more profoundly. A piece of music can conjure things that it's almost impossible to put into words. So can a painting. And so I kind of agree with language. You, let me throw in a challenge. Please. One of the things that's critical to what you do or what a musician does is, <coughs> excuse me, is phenomenal craftsmanship. Hmm. Absolutely. Now, a writer would say they need phenomenal craftsmanship, but it's essentially intellectual. They hmm. don't need that hand-eye coordination that hmm. a guitarist or violin player or an artist needs. Hmm. Well, and I would say in many respects, it is an incredibly encompassing art, but it does have that difference. But then don't forget, music has differences from painting and drawing and theater and cinema have differences. From, they will all have things that make them distinct yeah. and probably more applicable to a certain situation. But having, I mean, I've, I've written as long as I've drawn, but seriously, only probably the last 25 years. And I think I'm just starting to get it because it's beginning to feel like drawing. Okay. And, and a part of it is that you do grow up with functional writing, right? You grow up with a, an academic, uh, business-like way of using words that have to do with thought. But what I've found now that makes writing so much easier is in the same way you can do a drawing and leave something out so the viewer will paint it or draw it in there themselves, right? And so that they'll focus on the things you have drawn and those rise in importance. And the same way that you can put smudgy bits, you know, a chiaroscuro, so you not too sure, is he smiling or is he frowning? I can't see the edges of his mouth, what's he doing? So the context provides and the emotion of the viewer provides the answer to that question. I found the best writing, most successful writing I've done is all about smudgy bits and things I leave out 
<laughs> right. Okay. You've got to create, and same way poetry does, you've got to create a feeling here and a feeling there that describes the thing that you've never described. You know, a lot of people will have very vivid impression of, um, of James Bond or of Sherlock Holmes, but I don't believe the authors actually really describe them. That's the easy ones then. When right. they do describe them, it would makes it very hard. I right. remember reading Gormenghast and the phenomenal detail he put into his <laughs> yes. descriptions. And I'd think, no, an artist would spend his life <laughs> with a checklist. <laughs> right. It's true. Well, he was an artist, wasn't he? Yes, but his writing didn't have that emotional description when he was right. describing a place. Right. It was too literal. Right. Yes. And it left no scope. <laughs> right. right. Well, I think Ray Bradbury, again, is the absolute epitome of not needing to describe something by describing everything else in the universe around it. He's so exaggerated, so full of joy about it, that you're left with this um, fireworks. And when it dies down, you've got the thing he was trying to describe without ever really describing it. So, and there's just like artists, there's so many different ways of achieving that end. Uh, Neil Jordan is one of the most amazing writers and especially screenwriters I've ever, ever read. Uh, and he, his script for The Crying Game, right? No matter what the film, the film's great, but the, the script is phenomenal because there's not one word extra in his descriptions. If you don't need it, it's gone. Hmm. And yet it describes more and conjures more than any screenplay I've ever read. So like I say, it just depends what you try to do. You have to put all those people aside and find your way of using words and so on. But honestly, Roger, if, if it felt to you like writing was a certain kind of structured thing, sit down and write so it's not. And try it your way and be brave and make all those mistakes and put them in that <laughs> drawer again to see 20 years later. But it really is, it, I think it's as much an art as, as drawing a painting as it just has different parameters and things it's good at and things it's not good at. <coughs> um, yeah, I'm, I like the idea of training the hand to train the mind. Mm. And that is to me, intriguingly different mm. for a writer. Yes. And um, I was significantly dyslexic. So mm. I was able to be articulate mm -hmm. <laughs> at the same time, incomprehensible. <laughs> <laughs> well, Lewis Carroll made a living out of that. <laughs> yes, <he did. laughs> His nonsense poems and words are amazing. Twas brilliant and the slithy toads did gyre and gimble in the wave. <laughs> Come on. Yes, brilliant. No, it's, it's, it is when you have a, uh, any kind of disadvantage, you know. Um, a lot of people don't have the coordination, aren't born with the coordination to use a pencil, um, but some, some are and it gives you a nice head start. But I find head starts are just head starts. If you work hard, you can catch up, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And for, for dyslexia, maybe I mentioned this to you last time, if, if it becomes, a, if that was a real impediment, just pick up a recorder, just do this. Call me, tell me your stories. I'll write them down. <laughs> that could happen. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, yeah, bedtime, bedtime stories, this is perfect. <laughs> I did actually record the stories I told Freya. What? About a year in, I thought, maybe I should record these. Yes. So you still have those then? I do, yeah. They're all on cassette, though. But yeah, I do. Why not publish a, a book of bedtime stories? Roger Dean's bedtime stories. Well, it could happen. It could ah. <laughs> I would love that. I think, I think right now, especially, it's easier to make books quicker and more pure to make a book than it is to make a movie, right? The, the industry's shut down right now. We, even doing a live action shoot is very problematic. There is some of that going on um, with the new COVID unit attached to make sure nobody is um, 
you know, has got the disease and if they have, they have to shut down certain things that have to happen and it just sends the budgets through the roof. Animation's doing well. Right. Because animators, you know, often they don't have to be in the same studio together. <clears throat> they send their work in. And uh, I think Despicable Me was made with, four, was it four different animation small studios around the world who never met? <laughs> right. They talked a lot but they never actually physically went. They just sent stuff back and forth. So, so filmmaking's tricky now and books have not stopped. You know, I, th I think nothing can stop books really because it is a lot of time alone in the studio, right? <laughs> Tell me what, how you envisage your sketchbooks being published. Sketchbook has a publisher already who was, I, I told them what the idea was and they had enough faith in me to go ahead and. <laughs> So I will have no, other than the layout and suggestions on what stock we print on and so on, I really don't have much control over the final um, okay. uh, printing of it all. Uh, it's, it's done by a group called Art Station and I, I have some examples of their books. So I'll, I'll show you another time. They're a big format like this, uh, landscape. So when it opens up, it becomes almost like an anamorphic cinema. Right. Very, very wide widescreen. And uh, the page is mine to do whatever I want with. So I got rid of all the words. And there's no words in the entire book um, other than the title and maybe a sound effect or two. And the word lost on a poster. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, there's no words. You must have Michael, Michael Kalita's sketchbook. I don't know. Mike did a sketchbook? Well, no, he did a, a lot. And then... Oh my gosh. Did you publish them? I didn't know. I wish. Um, and then there was a collection of his sketchbooks. Wow. And he has anecdotes in it and insights right. that right. are amazing. Of course, they would be. <laughs> they would be. Yes, they would be. Yeah, he's, a, he's another good storyteller. He's brilliant, yes. He's a brilliant <laughs> designer too, he's yes. not just an artist. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> yeah, and, and like a fingerprint, I can tell his work anywhere. I, there's a lot of writers I didn't read because um, I, I had my heroes and my favorites and I would just plunder them forever. So I missed out on all of George R. R. Martin's books. I think maybe when someone becomes very popular, it kind of puts me off a little bit. I like to discover them. <laughs> um, I, I read Ursula Le Guin's Wizard of Earthsea practically, and it's not first printing, but pretty close. Right. You know, and I feel like I found her, even though she's, she's everywhere. She's another one of my heroes. And I learned a lot about writing and creating from, from her too. She's I mean, brilliant, isn't she? Oh, her books are brilliant. Well, and just a lot of her quotes and insights, you know? Yeah. Uh, one of one of the things she said was that there's no wall so high and impenetrable as the ones we build for ourselves. Yeah. And I find that with people who say, I can't, you know, I won't, I shouldn't. It's like, well, you just built a wall. Of course you can. <laughs> it's going to cost you something, but you can I do wish, it. I wish I could remember one of her, I don't know, it's a collection of writings. But mm. The first article in this book starts off with is so strange she says i'm not a woman yes women weren't invented until much later <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's true if you look at wizard of earth sea um it's written as a traditional fantasy book and uh, there are three women in it and they're only in it for spaces of paragraphs they're not main characters and it really was right on the brink of her becoming aware of just how marginalized women were as characters and writers and so on. So the very next Earthsea book is about a woman. And you wonder where the main character's gone from the last book. Yes. And it's all this woman and, and her temple and, and the things that she loves. And then a thief sneaks in at the very end of the book to steal something. And you realize, oh my gosh, that's the guy from the first book. <laughs> You see them through totally different eyes now. And yeah, she has written some amazing books that break every barrier about. But I mentioned George R. R. Martin because he felt so commercial and so on. I, and you know, I, I watched his Game of Thrones and that wasn't really representative of his books. My daughter kept saying you should read his books. 
So I got a collection of his short stories from the library yesterday. I still go to libraries, by the way, love libraries. And, uh, and lo and behold, I open it up and there's the fingerprint right on the front in this black and white sketch. And it suddenly I eclipsed the book. So I flipped through finding every drawing I could. It was all Mike Kaluta. <laughs> it was for George R. R. Martin's stories. I don't think of him as doing that kind of thing, but, but of course, it's partly his design. I just knew from the swooping lines of architecture coming in that made no sense other than to make your eye go there. Yeah. Yes. And they're beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. I, I'm going to write that down and check it out. Mm. You know what? I'll, I'll text it to you, Roger. I'll send you the title and I'll send you the publisher so you can find it easy enough. Well, how about we talk Wait, about And then George R. R. Martin's stories are actually really great. So I'll get the book. <laughs> yeah, kind of, kind of like Ray Bradbury. He's got a great sense of joy and sense of humor and all that stuff, you know, and he, doing it in his own way. So, uh, yeah, I do recommend it. I'll send you the title. But anyway, back to the talk. <laughs> yeah. There was one little story I loved, which I would love to get, include in this, was when Michael, as we're talking about Michael, he, he introduced us, right. and we went up to your house that you were renting which yes. had that outdoor studio about mm. 20 foot diameter mm. on the stub of a giant redwood that That's had right. second growth that almost totally enclosed it. That's right. That was our storytelling circle. That's right. You said. Yeah, you jump up on the main stump and tell the story and everyone else sits with their back to a tree, listens to the story and then swap. It's important that everyone there tells the story. Yeah, it's... it's you know, it's nature. You can't beat it. It's the best designers, the best inspiration. Um, when people ask where to get your ideas from, it's like, really? <laughs> Go outside. Yeah. Well, okay, yeah. <laughs> Go for a walk. It's all around you. And, and the, if we keep curious about things, you keep your um, antenna up to catch ideas when they come. You can't, I don't think, maybe there's artists that can do this, I don't think you can actually go to find a certain kind of idea and find it. That's never happened to me. No, me neither. Yeah, you always, like, like you were saying about over that shoulder, you, you don't look for the thing you're looking for. You go with humbleness and curiosity and, and joy and just be open to everything. And then deep, deep back here, there's the thing you're looking for, but shh, don't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> And then when the idea comes up that kind of lights that up a little bit, that thing back here, it's like, oh, won't you come in and have some tea? Let me see you better. I know I'll draw you. Oh, aren't you lovely? <laughs> I, I repeat this a lot too, but there's a, to me, a lovely insightful anecdote from mm. Niels Bohr from around 1900. Right. He thought a lot about ideas. <coughs> and he postulated something which he called the gunslinger theory. Mm -hmm. And that was two absolutely equal gunslingers. Stand off. The one who draws first always loses. Because <laughs> he thought. Because he thought instead of reacting. Right. And his idea was that, um, <coughs> excuse me the part of your brain that reacts is way more efficient and inventive and quick mm. than the part that thinks. Mm. Yes, as long as you've also trained your reactive part. It's like kendo and a martial art and all that. If you do the body, do, do the exercise enough that it becomes body memory, yeah. then kendo, yes, it's there when you need it, absolutely. The idea is that you can act without thought. Yes. Or maybe it's a different kind of thinking. Well, they don't mean thoughtless action, that's for sure. <laughs> right. No, but maybe it's a, a subconscious, a tapping into that. Kind. It's a different way of thinking when you're asleep. Um, ever since I was 14 and I read Dune back then, um, I've been fascinated by the idea that your mind has superpowers. You can, you can use what's up there 
more than anyone knows. I'm going to be listening, but I'm going to get myself a cough pest. You know what? That's why I've got this. No, no, go, go. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not far away. All right. Can you hear me or do you want me to wait? I'll wait. No, no, no. I can hear you perfectly. All right. So ever since I was 14, I have been uh, training myself to lucid dream. Do, do you know what that is? Do you do that? I've heard of it, but tell, tell me. Okay, and it, it can be learned. It's, it's not even very hard. Lucid dreaming is when you are consciously awake inside your dream. So your dream, you're fully subconscious. Things are happening. You're seeing things. Stories are going on. It's really, it's your mind trying to puzzle out things that caught your attention during the day, good and bad, mm -hmm. and memories that you don't want to forget. So it brings those in too. And, um, your stock, your repertoire of characters in your memory, you get to pull those out too, and they get to act parts for you. Um, but you can also teach yourself to be awake inside <laughs> that. Uh, it's usually as a character or as a part, but from there, you're conscious. Mm. And you think in a conscious way. And um, what I wanted to do, the whole reason I wanted to do this, I thought, well, how fun. I'm already making up these perfect things. If I could just have one pose for me, I could draw it. I'd be done the, you know, done the cover I need to do. So what I'll do is I'll go into my subconscious consciously and I'll create it there. And then I'll throw it into the dream, watch it come to life and say, excuse me, can you do this? And then I'll draw it real quick. To do that, I need to both be able to be conscious and create things in my dreams. And second, I need to unfreeze the paralysis that happens that stops us from sleepwalking or acting out our dreams. I need to undo that chemical in my hand and my eyes. And if I can open my eyes while I'm dreaming and if I can move my hand while I'm dreaming, I can draw those things because I'll still be seeing them. So anyway, that was the plan. But what it, what it did is it allowed me to be um, conscious of another way of thinking. Uh, when, you're, when you're dreaming, you relax. You don't actually, uh, you don't have a plan. You're not going forward on a map. You, you have an idea of something that's bothering you, interesting you or whatever, and then you relax back into it and it just goes in this vast, long plane of connections and things. And out of that, you come up with an answer that your conscious self can go, thank you, I'll remember that. Thank you, I'll take this. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, think, I think all artists can learn to do that. But I think this reacting fast actually comes from that subconscious self. Because truly, when you do this, you have all the answers laid out patterns form conscious self goes that and it can do that in a fraction of a second and by the way i, I did finally it was a couple of years ago now but i did finally unfreeze the chemical <laughs> it was fantastic roger it was fantastic i was fast asleep in a field in a you know in a thunderstorm and i i was in a bed and my wife was next to me in the dream in my bed and i'm there and i suddenly my conscious self I woke myself up and I looked and I realized, whoa, wait a minute, my eyes are open. That is actually my wife. And then I looked around and there's the field and there's the thunderstorm and it's, I'm seeing this with my eyes open. And I know I'm conscious because I've done this for, you know, 40 odd years. And then I turn and my wife is wide awake and looking very scared. And she says, what is it? And I went, oh my God, I'm speaking to you inside a dream. <laughs> Only the voice didn't come out of just my mouth. It came from the sky and it was thunder. And finally I turned to the dream and I went, you can go now. And it just went, and went away. And I was, and then I, and I turned to her and explained what had happened. And I'm sorry if I scared you, but you know, one of those experiments I do. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I just think there's so much in here and the creative process is maybe it's different for all of us, you know? Maybe some people can't do that, but I like to think you can. I've taught a lot of people to lucid dream. It's, like I say, it's not hard. I there's even, so. there's a school in China that teaches it. Really? Yeah. I must look into that. I'm I'll try and find your name. Working 
I can get to that point where I'm not doing the conscious analytical thinking, which right. is so restrictive and mm. it's a barrier to creative thought. Absolutely. And I can switch that off mm -hmm. and allow the space for the ideas to flow. Mm -hmm. and That's the same thing. Them, you know, like you, yeah. my sketchbooks are full of ideas for... <laughs> Right? <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Let's, we, we've got a few minutes left. Are you okay? <laughs> yes. In. No, I'm fine. But we should talk about the future. <laughs> there you go. That was good. All right. Be. Maybe we'll do another one on the future. But All right. Fair we, were, we were talking a few years ago about working on a, a film or TV series. I don't think it ever settled into one or the other. Right. And various funders disappeared. And Mark went one way, I went another. Right. Um, but we've got back together and are talking. But Excellent. That particular project didn't happen. I'm talking to Mark about the future on, I think it's the 9th or the 12th of November. I'll, I'll have to check. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> No, I, I love I love his optimism. I love his wealth of knowledge. Yes, me too. Mm -hmm. We we worked on a project about the future back in the eighties, a long time ago. Huh? It was so expensive. Um, we were at the time talking to Sid Mead, mm -hmm. but to build sets, which was the only practical way of doing it, sets and models, right. was horrendous. I'm not kidding. And when we revisited the idea, which was decades later, um, when it was technically possible to do it on a fraction of the budget, um, we pretty much knew we had to find a book. And Mark's book was perfect. <clears throat> it's called, I, I know you know it, but just so everyone knows it, it's called The Optimist Tour of the Future. And he's done a second book called um, We Do Things Differently. And they're both brilliant. They're both brilliant. But what was, <clears throat> when, you, when we were talking, you and I, the thing about all those things in that book that made the future so exciting, a place you would not only want to live, you'd want your kids and grandkids to live. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> they were essentially invisible. An abundance of clean water. Mm -hmm invisible yeah. you know plentiful food is invisible clearing the pollution out of the oceans clearing it out of the air all yeah. these incredibly important things are invisible so yeah. what does the future look like and the challenge was okay the future looks like what we make it mm -hmm. and so where we live and how we live is critical. And there seem to be two aspects of this, which were both equally worth looking at. Where yeah. we live, cities, houses, whatever, and how we travel. Yeah. Well, that's... So the visions great. of the future that you and I talked about kind of co collapsed down into those two aspects. There would have been much more, of course. But yeah. in essence, that was it. <clears throat> Which comes back to the question I asked you at the very beginning. What is it that inspires you about landscapes? What inspires me about figures? Because that, those two things together is what inspires me about the future. In a time when a lot of people are very not optimistic about the future and not optimistic and, and worse, extremely polarized mm. in opinions and fighting with each other to try and be right. And really, you, your vision of the future, when you talk about it to me, you talk about the environment that people live in, not, not just the environment outside, but the environments inside that we build for ourselves and how that affects us, how that mm. channels our thinking and feelings and moods and opportunities and do you feel free and inspired inside your house do you feel contained do you feel uh you know 
I think you said in one of your talks that post-war buildings had to be done very cheaply and they became these blocks. But there was nothing inspiring about them. I think I stayed in one of those in Cumbernauld up in Scotland. It just was supposed to be a design of the future city and it was horrible to live in. Yes, they were disasters. Right. right. And, and they were disasters because they were done cheaply, by the way. They were disasters mm -hmm. because architecture had bought into a theology of design mm -hmm. rather than rational thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When I talk to architectural students, I do challenge them with that. I say, this is theology. It's a belief system with delusions of rationality. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. I think we, being storytellers, can delude ourselves very quickly. Yeah. <laughs> so in the same way that that, that is your joy, and that's the, one of the things that pulls at you, what brings me joy is why are people polarized? Why can't people agree? But even more important, how can they agree? Because we can. And then it, then it struck me that, well, wait a minute, the, an environment, the world that we live in is, is a kind of machine. It functions in, in very complex and multi-level ways, but it functions as a machine. When something goes wrong here in the natural world, it tends to be compensated for here and corrected there. And then something new might need to come out of it to balance it back up again. But it, it works like that throughout all of history. It's always done that balancing. <laughs> and human beings are kind of machines too. You know, we, we, our bodies function a certain way, your heart beats, you breathe, you, you know, the, the machine has to uh, be maintained, has to, when parts fail, you have to either replace them or fix them, and otherwise we start to fall apart. But for me, two people communicating with each other is a machine too, right? How people live in bigger groups together is, is another kind of machine. And I think what's happened is just that the machine is broken now and needs to correct. I think we need, from, from my interest, which is in the human part of that machine, how, what do we do? We, well, we, we learn how to agree again. We learn how to have a conversation so we can agree and how to have one that isn't all about fighting and winning. It's more about what do the two of us both want? What's our common goal? Even if with totally different ideologies, what is, the, what is the thing we both want? We probably both want to survive. We probably both want to be happy. Probably both want to provide for our children. Okay, so if you see this way of doing it and I see that way, but we both want to go there, how do we get there? How do we help each other to both get there? Because then we both win. So I think we can fix this. I think we will fix it. And the reason I'm optimistic about that is that I... I've seen the machine working really well and it produces miracles, right? You can see it quite easily in the arts and things do come out that people think are magic acts that they could never do. But you also see it in people helping each other, reaching out and, and um, building things, creating things for each other that, uh, you know, putting a man on the moon, just stuff that we did because we worked together towards a goal. I thought when we were talking about this film that your job and my job would be to create as an exciting and inspirational future as possible. Right. Really invite people to demand better. Yes. Yes. Because what you're doing there is you're showing them the goal. Yeah. Do something that you would want to, no matter what your political affiliation and your ideologies, theologies, you probably want that too. Yeah. So yeah, we can show that to them. And that, that is tangible. Yeah. That's the job of an artist to be able to create that vision and show them what it is without propounding some sort of very specific ideology to get there. Yes. Yeah, your children, <clears throat> your grandchildren could live in a future that is not only affordable, it, we cannot afford not to do it. Right. We have to do it. Yes. But we need to inspire people. And I think hope and inspiration is a more powerful engine than worry and anxiety. Uh -huh. So I think you can't frighten people into doing it right. 
as well as inspiring them to. Right. Well, we also have that side of us that will rebel against being compelled to do anything. We don't like tyranny of any kind, even when it's helping us. <laughs> and so people well, quite rightly will rebel. Yeah. So you don't want to trigger that defense mechanism in human beings. Instead, you want to tap into their empathy and um, inspiration and imagination and ability to create mm -hmm. and build. And all of a sudden, we're, we're that machine that's working again. And wow, the stuff we could do. And that's kind of what's in Mark's book. Right. I remember, I remember when we were working on that show, and I did pitch it to a number of, of uh, studios and financiers too. And I think I said, it's all right. Yes, we're probably all going to hell. Yes, the world is probably all going to be destroyed. But if it isn't, <coughs> if there's this fine line that we would walk to a place where we made it. Mm. And we did destroy ourselves. What is that place? That's what we want to show you in this movie. Yeah. Yeah, so nothing's changed. I think we should still do it. <laughs> I'm going to answer your question. Yes, please. When I was in Hong Kong, Hong Kong was an incredibly influential and inspirational time for me because I was age 12 to 14. Mm. <clears throat> Rock and roll was everywhere. I remember. <laughs> and, um, my vision of England, my ideas about landscape were an odd mixture sure. of Rupert Bear, <laughs> illustrated <laughs> by Alfred Bestel, yes, to live in like Wales, mm -hmm. and the Chinese watercolour landscape artists, mm -hmm. mountains, waterfalls and pine trees. Yeah. You can see how that rang a bell and yeah. never stopped ringing. Never. <laughs> And the third thing was when I was younger, from about age of 10, mm. or even younger, I got to walking. And when we lived in Wiltshire, I walked everywhere. You know, I would go out at eight in the morning yeah. in the summer, come back at eight at night, and have walked. But in Hong Kong, I did the same. But there were mountains there. It wasn't just walking. And mm. that process of following pathways through the landscape seemed to me very magical. It mm. was a storytelling process, a prayer even. It was mm -hmm. all those things. And I never got over the joy of the endless change in vista. Mm. When I wrote my thesis on the psychology of the built environment, which is what I did at the Royal College. Right. Um, I wrote a whole chunk on, excuse me, I'm meeting this cough bastard, which seems to be working, <laughs> um, on urban and uh, landscape pathways, pathways in the landscape. Mm -hmm. And it was the choreography that fascinated me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm I'm uh, similarly inspired, <clears throat> but I still wonder why I didn't sit down and follow the landscape path. I remember when I was much younger thinking, oh, what's the point of drawing this landscape without a figure in front of it? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that anymore, but I did. I think when I was young, I just, I had so many interesting people around me. My dad was a physical therapist and he worked with very, very old people. Um, not, not at the beginning of his career. He actually was in Hollywood rubbing movie star backs, which is where I was, I was born down there because of that. But he sort of felt like that wasn't why I became a healer. I, um, you know, I want to help people who are uh, probably not getting help, you know. So he went up to Canada and started to practice where he was taking care of people too old to qualify for physical therapy. They'd have a stroke. They're going to die in, in a short while. Why would you get them walking again? And mm -hmm. dad would say, because then they won't die in a short while then. They'll die in a longer while. And so he was kind of that Patch Adams guy that would put the nose on and you know challenge them to races and all that kind of stuff. And lo and behold, he got them all walking. Um, and they, they didn't die in a week, they died in a year, but it was a great year. 
And dad always taught me that a little bit of time counted. And he brought me into the hospital with him, into the practice. And he'd say, draw, draw for these people. They all want a picture of something to give to the doctor. So draw, draw that for them. And um, so I did. I drew it. But what I got in return from endless old, old, old people were these incredible life stories. Incredible. Um, a lot of people had come out of the war. A lot of people had lost people in the war. A lot of people done heroic and adventurous things that I knew as I was drawing the pictures of the doctors for them. When you go, that story goes with you. Mm. So please, you know, tell me. I'll, I'll remember. I'll do my best. I'll remember it. And I still do. I remember a lot of those stories. There are actually a lot of the things that I write come from those that time. But I was also fascinated by the faces because I knew, well, wait a minute. I'm going to be in that bed one day. <laughs> and how cool I could put my finger up on the top of your eyelid and probably slide around almost to the back. It's just so deep back there. And I, I love that there's a, there's a secret path inside us of what we're going to become when we're old. Hmm. And that we're going to find out if we're lucky to live that long you know, how we, like Norman Rockwell from that young, svelte Norman Rockwell turned into this old kind of lizard Norman Rockwell. They were both magnificent to me. And I've always wanted to see my path growing into that. So to do that, I study people. I study how people grow and change and how they move. And that led me to realizing that when you look at people in a cafe talking or on the street talking, um, read their body language. It says so much more than their words. So I'll sit back and decide, do they like each other? Did they just have a fight? Ooh, he is trying to mate. This is interesting. And she doesn't want to. And you can tell all of that just from, you know, crossing of arms and turning of shoulders and tilt of heads and leanings of bodies and stuff. And then here's this language shouting all these wonderful stories and adventures and things that we don't take the time to really listen to. But I do. That's what fascinates me about people. It's funny, actually. My mum is still telling me stories <laughs> I've never heard before. Wow. Wow. And how old is your mum now? She's 99. Wow. Well, she's 99 in three weeks. So. Wow. Think of the things she's seen, Roger, the changes in the world. My God. Yeah, I know. And All she right. the same answer as me. So even that's an interesting to see it yeah. at that earlier stage through her eyes. Right. Yes. Yes. Both of my parents are gone now. I, I besieged them with questions before they went and I made them write their memoirs down. <laughs> but there's a, there's a time when you just, you didn't talk about bad things that happened, right? You didn't talk, it wasn't so common to, it was impolite to talk about fights in the family and to do exposés and, and so on. And mm -hmm. so the biographies from my mom and my dad are fascinating up to the point where I'm born. <laughs> and then they go, oh, stop. Is that me? <laughs> oh boy, sorry about that. Yeah, they're fascinating up to the point where I'm born and then they suddenly become very polite and boring. <laughs> Because they don't want me to know what really happened. <laughs> anyway, I think I should probably go for this time, Roger. Ian, thank you so very much. Oh, are you kidding? I really could do this regularly. It's so great to see you again. And, and I meant what I said about the books Good. and the TV show. If you, uh, if you need help, I'm here. Well, we help. will be in touch. But let me ask you one last question. Freya and I are going to do a two-minute introduction. Is it okay to mention the projects that you've worked on? Yes, of course. One you want us to talk about, for example. Oh, no, no, please do. You can. I have an IMDb page which talks about all my film work and lists the films that I've worked on and so on. I can send you a biography that lists everything as well. Um, but just remember that there was a good 10 years before any of that nonsense when I was doing books and I've never stopped. I still do books and posters and cards and prints and stuff. Right. And send me the yeah. Michael Kaluta illustrated book. I will. I will. <laughs> I love his work. I love oh, it. 
me too. And Mike, I love him as well. I love him. All right, my friend. See you Thanks next time. You. Take care. Thanks, Bye-bye.